Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you aboard San Juan Cruz's Victoria Star. My name is Brian Griffin, and I will be your historian narrator for this evening. This is the 36th year that the Watkin Museum has hosted these history cruises, and I'm pleased to welcome you on behalf of our wonderful community museum. The museum person who welcomed you at the gate this evening is aboard to help you in any way possible. Uh, her name is Althea. No, her name tonight is Becky. And our captain is Captain Casey. We'll leave the dock shortly. We'll cruise south down the shoreline to Chuckanut Bay, then back across Bellingham Bay to Squalicum Waterway, and then we'll slowly make our way along the Bellingham shoreline to our berth here at the cruise terminal, getting here about 8.30. Looks like a lovely evening. Hopefully we'll see some wildlife, and I will enjoy telling you of the history, the past and present, and maybe something of the future as we cruise the shore. We're cruising tonight on the Victoria Star. She's 100 feet long with a beam of 25 feet. The Star was originally built as a crew boat to ferry workers and supplies to offshore oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. Then she operated as a foot ferry to some of the islands off the California coast, Catalina Island among them. In 1992 and 1995, she was a spectator boat for the America Cup's races in San Diego. And finally, in 1995, she was purchased by the San Juan Cruz folks, considerably remodeled, and put into her present service. She makes a daily whale-watching run to the San Juan Islands with a stop at Friday Harbor. She's available for private charter and is busy with several delightful evening dinner cruises leaving from this very dock. We leave tonight from the Bellingham Cruise Terminal, a property of the Port of Bellingham. The port bought this site in 1965 from Pacific American Fisheries. The beautiful cruise terminal building designed by local architect John Stewart was built in 1989 to accommodate the Alaska ferry system, which changed its southern terminus from Seattle to Bellingham in that year. If you've not been in the building yet, give yourself a treat. It's a very handsome structure. So let me begin our tour by telling you that about 13,000 years ago, the last glacier of the Ice Age moved down from the north and stopped right here where we are at this moment. It scraped along what is now Bellingham Bay, pushing before it, like a bulldozer, a huge mound of gravel and dirt. And when it stopped here at Fairhaven, that mound of dirt, called a glacial moraine, was deposited just behind us where Harris Avenue and Marine Park now sit. That great mound of glacial till was about 80 feet high. This is an 1889 Coast and Geodetic Survey, and this shows that glacial moraine. Notice this says mud flats. So this was all mud flats, and this is the current bank uh, that you look down upon the buildings that are uh, the old Uniflight plant and that sort of building below Fairhaven. If you, this would be Harris Avenue, the current main street of Fairhaven, and you notice that it went straight down along, it, it really went along the beach. Everything north of today's present uh, Harris Avenue used to be in the water. It was mud flat. And if you've ever wondered in Fairhaven why Mackenzie Avenue is wider than Harris Avenue, Dan Harris, when he planted the town, made Mackenzie wider because that was the only bridge across Padden Creek. That's why Mackenzie, he thought, would be the main street. That long, narrow, and high ridge of land was called Poe's Point because Alonzo Poe was the first person to own it. So here it is. Here's an old photograph, and you can see this high point of land. That, was, that is the glacial moraine that really made Fairhaven a safe port. 
Fairhaven had deep water beyond the mudflats, and behind this, uh, this glacial moraine, long, this long point, with tall trees on it, it protected the harbor from the prevailing southerly winds. So when Dan Harris planted the town in 1886 and named it Fairhaven, it, in fact, was a fair haven. Later, the Pose Point gained uh, other names, Dead Man's Point, Graveyard Point, Commercial Point. But Pose Point is the proper historic name. It provided the cove, protection from the prevailing southerlies, and perhaps can be credited with Dan Harris calling his town Fair Haven. Pose Point was penetrated to make room for the Great Northern Railroad in 1902, and in, by 1918, it had been entirely leveled. Its gravel spread to create all of the land that we now see north of Harris Avenue, including the land that the train and the bus depot sit on. The cruise terminal, uh, well, before that time, the waters of Harris Bay lapped up to the side of Harris Avenue. And built upon piling on this side of the railroad track were two great salmon canneries begun in the late 1890s. By 1920, one of them, Pacific American Fisheries, located right where we are now, we're now down in Fairhaven, remember, was the world's largest salmon cannery. The last of its original buildings was demolished just last year. Well, now that's not quite right. Our, brick, our current brick railroad station, just up the road, was the Pacific American Fisheries Headquarters building, built in 1935. So here's another wonderful old photo of old Fairhaven. And this is Dan Harris's ocean dock. And you notice the trains of the Bellingham Bay and British Columbia Railroad on it. And this dock was built in 1890 by the Fairhaven Land Company, designed and, and uh, supervised by J.J. Donovan. And on this dock, you'll see the rails, rails for the Fairhaven and Southern Railroad that, that Donovan was building from Cedro Woolley to Fairhaven at uh, the request of his employer, Nelson Bennett, and the Fairhaven Land Company. As we prepare to get underway, let me provide a little further historic perspective. It's likely that the first humans, the Native Americans, arrived here about 15,000 years ago as the great glacier that had covered the Salish Sea melted and receded. People of European descent didn't see this bay until 1791, only 228 years ago when Spanish explorer Francisco Eliza explored the bay. He was seeking the fabled Northwest Passage. The next year, 1792, another Spanish expedition, led by Captains Galliano and Valdez, sailed through the bay, and just two weeks later, Lieutenant Joseph Whidbey, in charge of Captain George Vancouver's longboat, arrived to chart the bay for the British Navy. After that, there was a long gap in the historical record, but the bay was certainly visited by English trappers from the Hudson Bay Company trading post that was established in Victoria. It's important to remember that all of the West Coast, north of Mexican California, was claimed by both England and the fledgling United States. In 1818, they had agreed to share the land peacefully until they could negotiate a peaceful division. It wasn't until 1846 that the two nations agreed by treaty to draw the border at the 49th parallel, just where it is today. Oregon Territory was then created. The Hudson Bay Company abandoned their headquarters at Fort Vancouver on the Columbia River and retrenched to Fort Victoria, which of course is now Victoria, British Columbia. Also in 1849, the United States took California from Mexico. And the next year, gold was discovered at Sutter's Mill. San Francisco boomed and was desperately needing lumber. In 1850, the US government passed the Oregon Donation Land Act to encourage settlement in their new lands. 
A married settler could receive 320 acres of land for almost nothing. A single man, 160 acres. And so it was that in 1852, the first white settlers arrived on Bellingham Bay. They were Henry Roeder and Russell Peabody, and they came to build a lumber mill at the falls at Whatcom Creek. Along their, around their mill, the town of Whatcom would grow. And soon, Roeder found coal along the shoreline to the east, and there would grow another pioneer town, Seaholm. And later, down the bay, two more small towns would pop up, Fairhaven and Bellingham. Finally, in 1903, all four of those towns had consolidated to become the Bellingham that we know today. We'll talk more about the details as we cruise the bay. Another great old picture, this is, uh, the, this is the oldest picture of Fairhaven. There were 140 people living here when Dan Harris sold Fairhaven to Nelson Bennett and the boom began. And here's after the boom. There's only one building in this picture that is still standing. But I have it in here to show you once again Poe's Point, that glacial moraine still standing at, the, at where the shipyard now is. And some of you will recognize the only still existing building, Tony's Coffee. So now we're about to leave. Now this is a bit of history now. Unfortunately, this is the faithful servant, a huge floating dry dock, 500 feet long, 132 feet wide, built in Japan in the 70s, spent most of its life in Hong Kong, and it was purchased by Fairhaven Shipyards a few years ago, towed here across the Pacific Ocean at a cost of $12 million to buy it and tow it here. It was large enough to take the large Washington State ferries and the Alaska ferry. Um, and as you know, a floating dry dock, you take it out into the water and, and fill the, the hull with water and sink it and then bring your boat into it and then pump the water out and the dry dock rises and then you tow the whole thing back to the shipyard and work on it. Unfortunately, it is no longer there. Puglia Engineering, that leased the port's shipyard, went bankrupt. This shipyard had always been profitable, I'm told. They owned two other shipyards, and then they got excited and went to San Francisco and bought a fourth shipyard, and they failed to do their uh, due diligence. They failed to realize that there was terrific um, pension debt, pension obligations on that fourth shipyard, and that broke them. So the Puglia Engineering had to, had to sell out and leave here, and the bank took this back, and, and it's, it's currently been moved out of Bellingham. But there was another, as we cruise around the corner, we see another uh, floating do dry dock. This one is made as ferro cement, cement and chicken wire. Made, it dates back to the Second World War. It was uh, bought as surplus by the port, then, then sold, I think, to Puglia later. Um, it served in the South Pacific during the war. It's gone too. So I don't really know, hopefully the shipyard isn't history, but it's been there successfully since 1918, so I suspect that someone will, uh, will lease it back release it from the port and start another shipyard, we will hope. Well, now we're a little farther around the corner, headed towards Chuckanut Bay, and we see Marine Park. This nice little pocket park was built by the port sometime in the 70s, and to their credit, it provided the very first public access to Bellingham's waterfront. This is, of course, where the famous Sea to Ski Race ends each Memorial Day, uh, as the kayaks land on the beach at finish time. Uh, it's also a great place to watch the waves when the winter storms are raging across Bellingham Bay. But I show it to you largely because right here would have been the tip of Poe's Point, and Alonzo Poe's house would have been right about here on the, on the 80 or 90 foot slope. Old timers used to call this first trestle, and behind it was Garland's Lagoon. It was a favorite place for swimming, 
Behind the beach was a marsh that would float, flood in the wintertime with fresh water, and the Fairhaven kids of the 20s and 30s found it a favorite ice skating place when the northeasters blew. In the water, in, the, in Garland's lagoon, a one-armed boat builder, Cap Garland, lived on, in a, on a wanagon floating on logs at the south end of the lagoon, and he built clinker-built rowboats there. Uh, his rowboat sold for $35. Well, now, of course, the ice skating marsh is the home of Bellingham's sewer treatment, sewage treatment plant, which, when built at the cost of $52 million, was the largest capital project in the city's history. Still may be. The people there that work there are quite proud. They say you can drink the water that comes out of that plant, but I haven't tried it, and I wouldn't advise you to. This is a pile driver prepared to drive pilings right across here to create the railroad track for the Great Northern. This would have been in 1902. And so this would have been Garland's Lagoon. And this was Poe's Point. And Alonzo Poe's house was right there. But this is a fun picture. This is the little ice skating pond that the old timers used to tell me about. And this is the Chinese workers' pig farm. PAF, Pacific American Fisheries, employed many Chinese laborers. And they lived in, in the China House, which is on piling on the water just north of, Fer of Harris Avenue. And uh, I remember Joe Hansen, a lovely old guy who passed away a few years ago at the age of 92, uh, but grew up in Lower Fairhaven in the 20s, telling me of watching the Chinese workers coming from their farm. This was their, where they grew their vegetables, and this is where they kept the pigs. Uh, and they would, uh, they would uh, they carry their vegetables and their food back to the China house on, on a board over their, over their shoulder with a load at either end, and they'd jauntily bounce along. He remembered that clearly. What I find interesting also in this picture is that this is the present street where the houses are now, and there's a sharp Presently, there's a sharp drop-off here, and the dog park is here, and uh, here's where the sewage treatment plant is. It's clear that when the sewage treatment plant was built, this land was pushed down here to fill the, to fill the, uh, uh, the marsh. But once again, we keep changing our world. So now let's go a little farther down the, down the coastline, and here we have the Post Point buoy. You know, there's a long been a debate in this community, there, or confusion, not a debate, well, I guess both, between Poe's Point and Post Point. I'm here tonight to tell you which is which. Poe's Point, I've already shown you, that's the glacial moraine owned by Alonzo Poe. Post Point is right here. Back in the early days, before the government was dealing with navigation aids, uh, they were concerned, the mariners were concerned about a shallow shelf that runs between this spot and Post Point. So Post Point is right here. There's a little rocky protuberance here. And it's named Post Point because the early settlers erected a post and painted it white and erected it right on the point right about there. Eventually, the federal government began to, to uh, get involved in marine safety, and they, of course, put the Post Point buoy out there. So that's Post Point. Now you know where both are. Post Point's in by the shipyard. Here is second trestle. Once again, they built trestles when there was an indentation in the land. They didn't want to make the railroad track go around that way, so they built a little bridge across the bay, and and put a river on, a track on it. And this used to be a wooden trestle as well. There's a story here, though. Um, in the early 40s, after the war, uh, Sam Peach and his wife Kate moved to Edgemore and built a nice house up uh, somewhere up in there. Sam loved to swim in the lagoon, 
Apparently, he swam almost every day, all year long. And he loved to put his, he loved to row out under the trestle and put his crab pot out. And one morning he woke up to find that the railroad had, was taking out the trestle and dumping rock. And they simply, they put a 30 inch uh, steel pipe right here and they just covered it with rock and Sam couldn't get his, get out to put out his crab pot. And the water began to foul up because it, it, it stagnant because there wasn't enough uh, uh, transmission of water through that pipe. Well, Sam was an attorney, and he sued the railroad, and he won. And he was delighted when the railroad had to come and tear out a lot of this rock and build this bridge. And so his kids told me I could tell you this story. When Sam died, he was cremated. And the first Memorial Day after his death, the family gathered here and put his ashes in the lagoon and watched them flow out on an outgoing tide into Bellingham Bay. Kind of a fun story. Well, as we're sailing along this coastline, we're seeing the fine homes of the Edgemore area of Bellingham. That land was all owned by Charles X. Larrabee and his wife, Frances Payne Larrabee. The Larrabees were major players in the Fairhaven boom of 1888 to 92, and they were principals of the Fairhaven Land Company. They owned the Fairhaven Hotel. They owned the Fairhaven and Southern Railway. After the boom busted, they stayed in Bellingham for the rest of their lives as benefactors of the community. Uh, and those generous and wealthy folks built their home, well, Mrs. Larrabee built their home, now called Laramont Manor, at the top of the hill. But until the mid-30s, there was, wasn't another house on that, on that vast acreage. Eventually, their son, Charles uh, Larrabee, uh, built a nice house up there. But the development of Edgemore didn't really begin uh, until after World War II. But Frances Larrabee was a wonderfully generous woman. This picture is taken from what is now Bayside Road. If you drive to 422 Bayside Road and look down over the cliff, over the hill, you will uh, see lovely homes. But this is Francis Larrabee's Hooverville. During the Depression, there were all kinds of men riding the rails, and they would uh, make camps wherever it was convenient. And Francis was generous enough to let them make a camp on the beach below, just inside Second Trestle. And she was kind enough to even allow them, she, she, there was a spring up the hill, and she piped water from her spring to the uh, Hooverville on the beach. But this, the Hooverville apparently grew because this is, this is an, a little uh, adjunct higher up on the, up on the hill. It's kind of fun. You wonder how I identified that by, juxtap by the juxtaposition of Orcas Island and, and Lummi and Point Francis. If you drive down the road until it looks exactly like that, you know where that picture was taken from. So now we've coasted down the beautiful shoreline of what is commonly called Clark's Point. My uh, C.X. Larrabee II, the grandson of the original C.X. Larrabee, was a friend of mine who also passed away at age 92 recently, within a year or so. We had wonderful correspondence. And he would just get very alarmed and upset when I would call this Clark's Point. He called it Dry Dock Point. That's the proper name. Uh, so just at the where the Burlington Northern Tunnel goes under the under the uh, under the point begins Dry Dock Point. The Larrabee descendants sold that beautiful point to a Bellingham grocer, Doug Clark, in 1958 for a mere $103,000. Clark built a road up the spine of the point, and he built his home at its very southern tip. It's still there, a nice little house. 
It's been a Clark, uh, called Clark's Point ever since, but that's only since 1958. But I'll show you why it should be called Dry Dock Point. If the weather allows, we will take you, the boat and you, into the beautiful natural dry dock and show you some amazing geological figures, features. By, by, uh, by the way, to their lasting credit, the Clark heirs have deeded their development rights on this land to the Whatcom Land Trust, so there can be no more development on Dry Dock Point. A couple of his children built houses there. There are three, there are three houses on Dry Dock Point, not to be any more. So this is, this is the entrance to the natural Dry Dock, and it is blessed with a flat, gently rising bottom, sandy bottom, and it's very narrow. And in the old days, before there was a shipyard anywhere around here, if you had a sailing ship and you had to get to its bottom to repair it, you would simply bring it into the natural dry dock, tie lines to either side to the trees, and let the tide go out. And then you could work on the bottom of your boat, and when the tide came back in, off you went again. Uh, we take, the cruise goes into this lovely spot all the way because there are some amazing things to see. Lovely chuckanut sandstone shorelines, but what's that? Well, it's a strange looking thing. The old timers used to think that that was the vertebrae of a sea monster or a huge fish larger than any creature still living. Some people thought it was the uh, trunk of a petrified uh, palm tree uh, because there are, you know, Ch the Chuckanut Mountains uh, have the palm tree fossils to be found. What do you suppose it is? It's a fascinating thing. There are several of them and um, Sadly, I asked a, a WWU geologist a few years ago just what in the world they were, and here was his response. He said, he declared that they were not fossils at all, but a calcious concretion formed when groundwater flowing along permeable zones in the sand bed precipitated calcium carbonate as a cementing agent. I don't understand what he was saying, and I prefer to think that that, that that is the vertebrae of a sea monster. You can think whatever you wish. At any rate, this is part of the Chuckanut sandstone found, uh, uh, formation, and uh, we're going to go around the corner now, out of the natural dry dock. You can see the railroad track in front. But we are looking at the sheer rock face of the old Chuckanut sandstone rock quarry. It was started in 1856, and Henry Roeder bought it a few years later, and over many years, he and eventually his son-in-law, Charles Roth, sold cut stone from, uh, from that quarry for many buildings in Bellingham, Seattle, and other towns. Uh, in fact, back in the back corner is the lighthouse building built of chuckanut stone. There used to be quite a few of them in, uh, in Bellingham. Uh, the Smith Island Lighthouse was built from that stone, the old state capitol building at Tacoma, the Pioneer Building in Seattle, the Portland Pioneer Courthouse, and, uh, well, and the, one of the last standing buildings in Bellingham is the Lottie Roth Block on Holly Street built of that sandstone. The sandstone from the quarry is of fine, hard quality, and it stands almost vertically, so they were able to slab it off in vertical falls. The quarry operated on and off until the first decade of the 1900s. Mind you, this, this quarry was built long before the railroad was built, so yeah, this original stone probably came out this far. They've taken a lot of rock out of that place. But this house, it sits on steel pillars driven into the sandstone wall. 
interesting place to be in the big earthquake, I think. Yacht Club Road comes down to the water from Chuckanut Highway, just at that big house with the tile roof. That's the home of the late Don Hagen, the grocer. And it's also the original site of the Bellingham Yacht Club and the ferry slip for the Orcas Island Ferry. So a ferry, yes, a ferry did run from there to Orcas for many years. The Yacht Club stood on the bank there, just beyond the, behind that flag. The Yacht Club was a cute little frame building with a little cupola that was reminiscent of a lighthouse. Well, the time came when, for one reason or another, the, the, it was moved on a barge uh, and towed to the, to the foot of Cornwall Avenue, where it existed uh, half on piles and half on land for many years. I can still remember that the dance floor was on the piles over water, and, um, and it wasn't very far above high tide because there was a big floating log stuck down there, and if the wind was blowing, when the tide was up, that log would bang below the dance floor, and gave us dancers a bit of a lift to our step. Uh, eventually, uh, the Yacht Club folks decided to build their new present clubhouse, and the, yacht, the old building was sold and put on a barge again and towed to Le Conner, where if you've had lunch or dinner at the Lighthouse Inn, you've had lunch or dinner in the old Bellingham Yacht Club that started there. So we traveled down a little farther into Pleasant Bay, and, um, and I talk about some of the wonders of, uh, that have happened in Pleasant Bay. We cruised by Governor's Point. Many of you will recognize Governor's Point as the long point that sticks out into the bay at the southern end of, of uh, Chuckanut, and I think it's important that you know that um, in recent years, its owners had tried to develop it and the city would not provide water. City, it's just outside the city limits. And consequently, it would have been very expensive to build a desalinization plant. They had trouble selling it. But I'm pleased to tell you that it was recently sold to a remarkable Canadian named Randy Bishop. Mr. Bishop sought out the Whatcom Land Trust and City of Bellingham officials and together they have agreed on a marvelous future for Governor's Point. Bishop will donate at least two-thirds of its 125 acres to the Whatcom Land Trust for a nature preserve. The preserve will include a two-mile loop trail and provide public access to the beaches on both sides of the point. At the city of Bellingham, in return, has re agreed to provide city water, but for just 16 homes, that Bishop will build on the south side of the point. All of those homes will be designed by his Vancouver architect to blend into the natural setting. None of them will be visible from the north side of the point, from Chuckanut Bay. I think a marvelous solution for a, uh, for a, a challenging problem. And I take my hat off to him and to the city and everybody involved. So we then, leave Belling, uh, Chuckanut Bay, and we cruise back across Bellingham Bay, and I have time to tell a few stories about, about that, and I won't go into them all here now, but I do want to tell you this story. We see, as we leave, Vendovi Island, and many of you know where Vendovi is. It's south of Lummi Island, <clears throat> and it's a great story. Its name, Vendovi, would cause you to think that it had been named by those early Spanish explorers, but not so. It was named by Charles Wilkes of the U.S. Navy during his expedition of 1840. He was on a mission to chart and explore the Pacific Ocean for, for the United States. And he was directed to go to Fiji and capture and hold prisoner the chief of the Rewa tribe of seagoing cannibals, which had eaten, killed and eaten the crew of an American whaler, the Charles Daggert, in 1833. So he did that. He captured Chief Vendovi, and uh, Vendovi, you know, they were out, uh, three years later they got back to this uh, continent, 
By that time, Vendovi was kind of a popular fellow, a member of the crew. He was given the run of the ship. And so by the time they entered the Salish Sea in 1841, he was very popular. And as Wilkes was mapping the islands, he named that island after the cannibal chief, Vendovi Island. Kind of a fun story. Oh, Vendovi was finally delivered to New York where he was expected to be tried for the murder of all those whalers, the murder and, and dining on all those whalers. They got him to New York, but he quickly died of a disease, and they cut his head off and gave it to the Smithsonian, and apparently, the, apparently it's still there. Uh, oh, I, do, I, I like to point out Orcas Island. I think you saw Orcas Island in that earlier picture. I love to tell people about the great 16,000 years ago, the great um, uh, ice sheet that, uh, that was over us. It was twice the height of Orcas Island, 5,000 feet, amazing. So the trip back is always kind of fun. I also like to tell people about, about uh, one of our local heroes, Bert Weber, who was a retired professor at the, from the university. For many, many years, those of us who grew up on the salt water used to say, we live on, I live on Puget Sound. Well, that was never correct. Puget Sound is only that body of water from Port Townsend South, named by Captain George Vancouver for his young officer, Peter Puget, who he had sent on a longboat to chart those waters. So all that water from Port Townsend down to past Seattle and Tacoma all the way down to Olympia, that's Puget Sound. Billingham Bay, what do you call it? Well, Bert Weber had a good idea. 20 years ago, he proposed a better name, a name to include all of the waters inside Vancouver Island on both sides of the border, and a name that credited the shared heritage of those first native inhabitants of this vast inland sea. Weber posed, proposed the name Salish Sea. It took a long time to pass all the necessary hoops on both sides of the border, but finally in 2008, the United States and Canada agreed to the name change. So we are now sailing on Bellingham Bay in the Salish Sea. Bellingham Bay is extremely shallow on the north side, on the north end. Uh, it gets deeper down by Fairhaven, but it's very shallow. Back in the early days, uh, in order to, well, the little towns of Whatcom and Seaholm, in order to get uh, large boats to service them, had to build docks out 500 feet into the, into the water. And the best evidence of that, well, before us, we see the best remaining evidence of the shallowness of the bay. This is the cement plant dock. And it had to go clear out here so that freighters could get into service uh, the cement plant. Incidentally, I've heard recently that the city is considering, the park department is considering using that dock for some sort of public marine access. I don't quite, I don't know anything about the plan, but, but I guess that's being thought of. And if that does work, I can tell you that the crabbing is great off that dock. I, my mother used to be a, a friend, used to play bridge with the wife of the cement plant uh, leader. And so she had access and I used to have to, I used to have to pack the crab pot. That's a long haul, I can tell you, all the way out there. And about there, we'd drop it in and we caught a lot of crabs. Uh, because it's so shallow, there are, the federal government dredges three, uh, three waterways in the north part of Bellingham Bay, and we're gonna go into the, the most westerly one, the Squalicum Creek waterway. This, this is supposed to be dredged to 27 feet to allow big ships, but the Nooksack River's been bringing in silt for a number of years, 
Apparently it's down to about 19 feet, but the Port of Bellingham has just succeeded in getting help and uh, getting the federal government to redredge that. So as we go in a little closer, uh, this building is Mount Baker Products, a plywood plant. Uh, here is where the bridge uh, goes over Squalicum Creek, where Squalicum Creek enters. And this is an interesting point. This is the place where the Eldridge family, uh, Edward and Teresa Eldridge, Edward was the third white man to come to Bellingham Bay, and his wife, Teresa, was the first white woman. And they ended up with 320 acres, and they uh, built a log cabin right on that spot. They prospered uh, by selling land, I think, partially. And, uh, and it, so uh, they built a rather grand Victorian house there, and it burned in a, in a terrible forest fire that swept that whole north part of Bellingham Bay. So finally their son built this house, which is still there, and uh, it, it was occupied by a, a Hugh Eldridge car, a relative of the Eldridges until about 20 years ago. So that's kind of a historic little spot. This building was built as a furniture factory, and then it's been redone as a, as a um, uh, office building, and it's, by, it's called the Gaston Bay uh, building because the Spanish called Bellingham Bay the Bay of Gaston. This is kind of fun. To guide ships down the center of the, um, of the waterway, the dredged waterway, they have these interesting uh, guys, and when you, uh, so when you get those two boards lined up, you know you're in the dead center. There's where Squalicum Creek comes in. Squalicum Creek begins at, Lake, at Squalicum Lake up at the Y Road, about 19 miles up Mount Baker Highway. And, and it, it's a salmon stream. Squalicum in the Native American language means place of the dog salmon. Here's Bellingham Cold Storage. Uh, that's the second, uh, that's the largest harborside cold storage plant on the West Coast. It's got a thousand foot dock. Uh, for many years, the Russian ships used to come in here to pick up frozen chicken wings. Some of you will remember that. When the Second World War broke out, the U.S. Navy needed, badly needed wooden minesweepers. Bellingham had a tradition of wooden boat building and many skilled shipwrights. So a Seattle stockbroker, Archie Talbot, bought a little shipyard that had been there, and he grew it into a major builder of minesweepers. When they, by the end of the Cold War, minesweepers were no longer needed, and Talbot then closed his shipyard and converted it into the Bellingham Cold Storage. Just recently, the Talbot family sold Bellingham Cold Storage to the Joshua Green Corporation, a Seattle investment company with deep roots in the Northwest. So, um, we cruise by Squalicum Harbor and we talk about that. Uh, we cruise by the INJ Waterway and we point out Bornstein Seafood, which is at the head of that. And, uh, I always like to tell the story about Meyer Bornstein starting his business by buying salmon from the big canneries in Fairhaven. He would, uh, canneries are built to handle six, seven, eight pound fish, and they can't handle a great big 40 pound spring salmon. Uh, so Meyer would buy them for 25 cents, a fish, not pound, and then he would sell them. And that's how Bornstein's fish company got its start. We go by Zwanich Park, and we go by the Bellwater Hotel, and we go by the ASB. Do you know what the ASB is? It's that huge rock enclosure built by the Lake, by the uh, Whatcom Creek Waterway by Georgia Pacific to receive and dis detoxify their wastewater. Uh, before the Clean Water Act in the, of the 1970s, 
their wastewater was simply dumped into Bellingham Bay. And um, if you had a boat in Squalicum Harbor then, you didn't have to paint the bottom because barnacles couldn't grow on anything in Bellingham Bay. But once they put this great rock, uh, they built the ASB to charge it with bacteria, which somehow consumes that toxic waste, and, um, and then we had to paint our bottoms. Well, it's now owned by the Port of Bellingham. Its future is being debated. Uh, initially, the port thought it might be a third in marina. They're now considering about half of the ASB, which means aerated stabilization basin, uh, to house marine-related industries such as boat repair, and et cetera. But now we are going to enter the Lake, the Whatcom Creek waterway. And this is, of course, leads to the estuary of Whatcom Creek and the waterfall that attracted Rudder and Peabody in 1852. And here's where it all began. Uh, only the falls is unchanged from that day, however. Uh, the, the, the Rotor and Peabody built their lumber mill on the east side of the creek, below the falls, just under the bluff. The saw was powered by water uh, carried in a flume from the top of the falls. Here is the granary. The granary was built in 1928 by the Washington Cooperative Egg and Poultry Association. Whatcom County used to be a great national leader in the egg and poultry industry. And uh, so here they, got, they brought in grain and ground it and made chicken feed, essentially. It was owned for many years by uh, Georgia Pacific. And uh, it recently was the port getting control of the land and the building, uh, sold it to uh, an Irish developer, Harcourt and Co Company, who have just redeveloped it and are attempting to get it leased. And of course, there's the building we're in right now, the wonderful 1892 Watkins building that was built by New Watkin as their city hall. Um, so Harcourt, the Irish developer, has also purchased land along the waterway uh, where they plan to build three residential condo buildings. And they have told us that they would like to purchase the old board mill building and convert it to a hotel and convention facility. They've been rather slow, and we'll hope that that will one day occur. So, so let's get out of the Whatcom Creek Waterway and the land left by Georgia Pacific. Well, there's the old acid ball. It's now a city, that's now become a city park. As we round the corner and head east, we see this interesting structure. The Bellingham Bay and British Columbia Railroad was eventually sold to uh, the Milwaukee Road, and strangely enough, the Milwaukee had no way to get their trains to Seattle. So imagine what they did. They would put railroad cars on barges and load them right here and tow them to down the south, I think to Everett, where they would unload them and put them on their own rail, and off they'd go. Pretty inefficient way to run a railroad. I do believe. But a little further in is the headquarters of what was the greatest economic powerhouse in Bellingham history, I think, the Bloedel Donovan Lumber Company. Bloedel came to Fairhaven in 1890 and was president of the Fairhaven National Bank. Donovan arrived in 88 and was the engineer hired to build the Fairhaven and Southern Railway for Nelson Bennett and the Fairhaven Land Company. And their silent partner was Peter Larson, who made a fortune building railroads and lived in Helena, Montana. The trio formed Lake Whatcom Logging Company in 1901, logging hills around Lake Whatcom. The first mill was built at the head of the lake where the park, Bloedel Donovan Park now is. Their second mill was right here. They bought a small mill built in the 1800s by the Bellingham uh, Bay Improvement Company, and they grew it. They called it their cargo mill because they were shipped from here lumber all around the world. And um, 
1928, their mill was the largest, they, the largest sawmill in the world. The mill, uh, this is their building that they built in 1913. And it still exists, there it is. It's now owned by a Nielsen Brothers Logging Company and it's an office building. And uh, so the sawmill spread down this way. We'll see a little bit more of it later. But here's the armory. The armory was, uh, by the way, a, a gray stone building, a Tuckanut stone building from the Tuckanut Quarry. Looks like a fortress or a castle. It was built in 1910 for the Washington State National Guard. Uh, it's the last building known to have been built of Tuckanut sandstone. It wasn't used, uh, well, it wasn't used as an armory for too many years. I can remember, and maybe some of you can, when it was a roller skating rink. And uh, eventually the state deeded it to the university who used it for storage. But just recently, a couple of years ago, it was purchased by two businessmen who grew up in Bellingham. Uh, they bought the armory from the university and uh, they're trying to figure out what to do with it. So if you have a great idea what it could be used for, contact Pete Dawson of Dawson Construction or his partner, Kurt O'Connor. They're two bright young men and I'm sure they'll do something good with it. Well, just a couple hundred feet down the way, you'll see a tarp-covered landfill. Whoops. By the way, look at how close to high tide this building is. This building, like most of the buildings below the bluff, this being the bluff, almost everything around Bellingham Bay below the bluff was built on piling over, over the tide flats. Here we go. So as you drive over State Street, you can look down and see this tarp-covered um, area. And that used to be the Bloedel Donovan Lumber Mill. And it used to be full of piling from their dock and their mill. And then the city of Bellingham needed a place to dump garbage. And so it became a Bellingham garbage dump. It just filled in around the piling. And, uh, and when the port did their last dredging of Squalicum Harbor, they brought all the dredge spill here and piled it up over the old garbage dump. And so the city is in the process of cleansing this dump and dewatering that dredge material. And I'm told that within a couple of years, this is gonna be a new city park that will be available to our use. And uh, I know that the city is even thinking about connecting it with another concrete walkway to Boulevard Park. That would be a very nice thing. Uh, there are lots of problems. Money is one of them, but the tribes have another problem. They don't, they don't want people building any more things out in the water where they like to fish. So there's a lot of negotiation that needs to go on, but it may happen. Well, above it is a building that uh, is familiar to many of you, and many of you, some of you, like me, might have been born there. That's the second St. Joseph's Hospital. The first St. Joseph's Hospital was built on 7th Street, 17th and Adams, way up high in the hill. And it was built in 1891, and uh, it lasted for 10 years, and uh, then uh, they found that, well, consolidation of the cities was getting close and uh, uh, they found they were a long ways out of the way and they had competition from the Protestant hospital, St. Luke's, and they decided they better get closer to the center of the population and on the city bus line. And so they moved to this location and built this building. So that was the second St. Joseph's Hospital. It grew and grew and grew and was added to and eventually the old wooden building was torn down and another modern building replaced it and finally they didn't have enough room and they moved to their present location in I think 1965. But this was the hospital for most of my lifetime. Well, for a long time. So let's go down a little farther. 
I don't know where these what these pilings are from. They could be from the old um, the old Bloedel Donovan Mill, or they could be what's left of the old coal bunker that you'll see in a moment. Um, let's go a little farther down. Ah, this is an interesting picture because it shows. Um, well, you can't quite see it, but the Great Northern Railroad track runs right along here. It's just from, just right along the bottom of the picture. This is the Bellingham Bay and Eastern right-of-way or railroad track, which you now would call the Bay Trail. That's now a walking path. And here is State Street, the original State Street, as it comes down from the rather higher hill out here where the hospital was. And this is the Welcome Bellingham sign. This is the boulevard. Now, the boulevard, you know, we t people tend to call the entire walkway, that entire roadway along the shoreline the boulevard, but that's not true. The boulevard is, was built in about 19... Four or five or six, to avoid the steep hill of State Street. At this end of State Street, where the roundabout now is, when you go up State Street, that's pretty steep, and it was hard for horses and and uh, in cold weather uh, vehicles to get over State Street. Plus, they wanted to build the interurban railway, which went along State Street, and uh, the railroads don't go over hills very well, so. Uh, they built the boulevard, which starts where the present roundabout is and comes flat along below State Street, and right here at the end, you enter State Street again. That's the boulevard, just in case you needed to know. Right up here is a house with a cupola. Um, it was the home of Alfred Black. Alfred Black was the first mayor of, or the last mayor of Fairhaven, and the first mayor of, of uh, Bellingham. And he was a great advocate of consolidating the cities to become Bellingham. He'd been an untiring worker in, in that behalf. And upon its success, he built the house. Unfortunately, I don't know why, you can't see it there, but it's right there. And he built it right on the borderline between Old Fairhaven and Old New Whatcom. So he built, and the house is, some of you may know the house is the Wall House. It was purchased by uh, the Wall, uh, J.B. Wall, the owner of Wall's department store. Some of you may remember it as the Muma House, but it's a great big stone house with a cupola and it's on Garden Street. No, it's on Forest Street, excuse me. Well, sorry about that. Let's go a little farther down the creek here. Ah, J.J. Donovan and uh, Julius Blodell and, uh, and a syndicate of wealthy um, Helena, Montana men owned and operated the Blue Canyon Mine. And they needed to get a, they needed to, and the coal mine had a good quality of coal and they needed to get it to the water so they could ship it. So they built the Bellingham Bay and, Br and Eastern Railroad, which is the railroad along the north shore of Lake Whatcom, now called the Hertz Trail. And they built that railroad right down through Bellingham, through the town, and down what is now, what you now call the Bay Trail, that right of way. And they, uh, to the coal bunker that they built, this was just, this stuck out into the, into the bay about 150 feet, just north of Boulevard Park. And so here's the train, the Bellingham Bay and Eastern train, just come in from Lake Whatcom and dumping coal into the wooden bunker into this big sailing ship. Well, from the bunker into the sailing ship. At any rate. That coal mine was successful for a good number of years because of the quality of coal. They became the, uh, the supplier of coal for the 
U.S. Navy Pacific Fleet. And Navy ships would come into this bunker and load up. Times have changed. The guys who built this thing also owned the Lake Watkin Logging Company, I might add. And so you notice that Donovan, who designed and built this bunker, also had a log dump. So they could bring logs or coal in and dump them and get them to the water. Clever people. All right, a little farther down the creek. Ah, here we are at the Star Rock buoy. Star spelling, spelled S-T-A-R-R. -R. The buoy is named after the George E. Star that was a side paddle steamer that uh, served on the Seattle Bellingham Bay run for many years. She was built in 1879. She was long and narrow with a large paddle wheel amidships on each side. She wasn't the best of ships. If she was heavily loaded, her paddle wheels descended too far into the water and she was very hard to steer. And if she, if she turned and she began to list, one of those paddle wheels would dig in deeper and turn her into an even a greater circle. So she was hard, hard ship to run. She was also not too reliable, apparently, because this ditty was written in a, in a Watkins newspaper. Paddle, paddle, Georgie Star. How we wonder where you are. <laughs> Leave Seattle half past 10, gets to Watkin God knows when. <laughs> it was the Georgie Star, having just let off her passengers at Fairhaven and steaming for Watkin, that found the rock just inshore from this buoy. The rock's still down there, six feet under at low tide, had named after the ship that, it, um, that discovered it about 1890. Happily, the star didn't sink, nor was she even hurt very badly. So we're looking at a number, another piece of history that's no longer there. That's the walkway that has been there, had been there since 19... 80, when Boulevard Park was built, but the, the termites and the rot got to it and the city had to take it down just a few months ago, maybe just a few weeks ago. But here's a historic site. See that flat land? That is the site of the old gas company, the gas plant uh, that was built in 1890 to provide coal gas for well, Seahome, Watkin, Fairhaven. Um, many of the houses in old Fairhaven had gas lights and uh, cooked with gas. And it was a, it was a coal, it was gas made with coal from Nelson Bennett's uh, coal mine in Cokedale near Cedro Woolley and brought up on his railroad from Cedro Woolley. And uh, if you compress coal and heat it enough, it gasifies and makes methane gas. So that was, the, that was the cool fuel source for cities all over the world back in the day. The gas plant operated until the 50s, believe it or not. And of course now this is this is the riprap protecting the lawn of Boulevard Park, one of our most popular parks. But this is a historic site as well. The Woods Coffee Building that you see there is built on Paddle's Point. Paddle's Point. William Paddle was an Englishman who came from Victoria, where he worked for the uh, uh, Hudson Bay Company. He moved to Bellingham, he took out land, he got 120 acres, and he was gonna be a coal miner. And he built his log cabin right on that point. And uh, there's a lot of historic interest in that, in, in what happened there. Well, much of it I talk about in my Boulevard Park book. At any rate, um, um, then eventually in uh, 18, hmm, 1890, um, Eldridge and Bartlett decided to build a sawmill. I mean, yes, a sawmill here, and uh, and and around it, the town of Bellingham, the first town of Bellingham. So, the sawmill was right here, 
This is from the Fairhaven Bird's Eye, the wonderful 1892 Fairhaven Bird's Eye. And here is the Eldridge and Bartlett Mill, which was later sold to the E.K. Wood Company and operated there uh, by E.K. Wood until 1925 when it burned. Another interesting piece out of this, however, did you know that the Nooksack River didn't always come into Bellingham Bay? It used to empty into over here into the Strait of Georgia behind Sandy Point. And in 1889, somewhere around there, the Corps of Engineers, in trying to blow up a, a, a big log jam on the Nooksack River up by Ferndale, changed the course of the river. Some people think it was at the behest of the timber companies in Bellingham Bay, because now you could cut a tree down up the river and it could float into the bay, and then it could be picked up and easily towed from there to there. Well, in 1890, a company was formed called the Bellingham Bay Boom Company, and they built a log catcher, a log trap. So this is the Bellingham Bay Boom Company's log trap. The logs would come down the river and they'd catch them here and they'd boom them up into a log uh, tow and here's a tugboat bringing the logs across to the sawmills on the bay. Well, that worked for a year or so, but the, there were little steamers trying to service Linden and Ferndale, little paddle wheel steamers, and they weren't happy because it was, well, they, people had a gate that was difficult to get through and, and uh, so they sued the Bellingham Boom Company, saying you violated our rights of navigation. And the, the suit went all the way through all the Washington courts and all the way to the US Supreme Court where the Supreme Court held in favor of the boat companies and they had to take out their, their, their thing there. It's still a landmark case for the rights of navigation. But the most amazing thing is if you drive out the Lummi Shore Road and you stop right about here and look out over the water, you can still see those pilings are still visible in the water. They've been there, how many years is it, since 1890? Amazing. History is still with us and visible in some cases. Okay, let's move on. Oh, here's another great picture of... Uh, the Eldridge and Bartlett Mill. Now, mind you, Woods Coffee is right there now, and Boulevard Park is all here, but notice, this is, notice how high this is? That's all been taken down and flat. This is the existing railroad track. The Bellingham Bay and Eastern came through this way. Um, and, uh, ooh. Well, there's the Bellingham Bay and Eastern track, which is now our boardwalk, and it was, there's the trestle, but they don't have the tracks on it yet. So that was, picture was taken in 1902. Here's the bi favorite bathing beach of the Slav kids when I was a boy. Uh, they used to steal their father's wine and come down here and have build a, build a fire, fire and have some nice parties. We kids used to call this Bunker Hill because Second World War, uh, Pearl Harbor and the Army immediately came and built machine gun bunkers on this hill. So th there were two of them on this little rock, and you, we called it Bunker Hill. Oh, well. Well, here's the chrysalis. There was another coal mine built here, and they were uh, discovered when McAvoy Oil Company took their oil tanks away. Under one of the largest tanks was the open maw of the Union Oil Company or the Union coal mine, excuse me. Ah, so. We're going on too long. This is the, this is the tin rock, uh, the residue from the t tin can company that made cans for the canneries. Here's Taylor Avenue. The Taylor Avenue dock used to stick out about 400 feet at the end of the bay with two warehouses in it. The old fishing boat captains before they went to Alaska you would come out here in the bay and point their, uh, to check their compasses and point their, uh, 
boat straight up the hill. And if their compass read exactly east, they, they knew it was good. These streets on the hill are all east and west. Well, this, there were lots of terrible fires along this piece of coastline. And in 1903, the Murchison Mill was built here and it, it uh, burned in its first year. Uh, then, of course, the, the recent fire was the uh, Reed Boiler Works. And now we get down to the mud flats in Fairhaven. We're almost through with our trip. These are the existing buildings. Many of you remember that the Uniflight Boat Company used to be there, and the Uniflight built their uh, boats, so mud flats. Those buildings that you just looked at are right about here. First on those mud flats was the uh, was a big sawmill, and it burned eventually. And then in '41, a group of Bellingham businessmen decided that plywood was going to be a good investment, so they built this big plywood plant, and uh, that operated for quite a while. Then they sold it to Georgia Pacific, and Georgia Pacific, just like they did. Uh, down here on the pulp mill. Got tired of running that shop. It apparently didn't make them enough money, so they just walked away and gave it to the port. Well, the port leased it to Uniflight, and that's where Uniflight built their building, their boats. And then it burned because it was built on piling over that mud flat. So here are the canneries that uh, that were so important to the economy of Bellingham and particularly Fairhaven. And up here you see the three buildings of the canning company that made the tin cans. And here's the Taylor Avenue dock. And, uh, and so we are back to our dock in Fairhaven. Thank you.